quanti applausi uh, ma quanti siete ragazzi grazie Radio Ali Blu come ci si sente dopo aver raccontato un'esperienza un'esperienza bella ci si sente bene raccontateci quell'esperienza perché a volte riviverla con un racconto a qualcuno può renderla magicamente eterna durante il giorno ascoltiamo tante parole siamo bombardati di messaggi di parole che destabilizzano il nostro stato d'animo qua a Radio Ali Blu vogliamo sentire parole belle e attendiamo le tue parole belle Radio Ali Blu la radio che ti fa volare Hi, thank you for having us on the show. Love the show. Um, I'm My Guy Monkey from My Guy Reviews. I'm My Guy Brig. Uh, we have our own podcast. We talk about pop culture related topics. Each week we bring a new topic to the table. A bit like your own. So if you're looking for more content like this when you're done, head over to My Guy Reviews. We talk about movies, video games, fant- fighting fantasy books, TV shows. And as much as My Guy Monkey hates it, we talk music as well type in the word my guy reviews at spotify youtube and your podcast service of choice the clockwork people wild man stroke knew about magic in his toy shop It whispered in his ear and went dancing breezes to tickle his nose even when the doors and windows were closed. The customers entered the building. The magic settled on their cheeks in a warm glow. Most adults wrote it off as a happy childhood memories brought on by the colourful toys, but the children knew better. They stared at Strutwell with wide eyes, and he could wink, he would wink. Whirls and clicks filled the shop. The Strutzel had bestowed the gift of movement to every toy. Tin cows kicked over the tin pails of anguished tin. Wing milkmaids, miniature trains belched steam as they rushed across tiny tracks. Engines and horses carriages, sea-sized for mouse drivers, chugged and chunked, chunked with curious children cranked the front handles. Chudo toy was only complete when the shop was full of happy children. He'd wrap up one toy after another, whispering a blessing for with each as he sent them off to new homes. The toy shop was located in a large village built around a great factory with giant rows of snow snacks and belched black clouds into the heavens. The company was owned by a kind man who cared for people and made sure each employee was paid fairly and not overworked. Payday tired factory workers slipped to a cosy shop on the way home to choose toys for their children. Most days, Shittel created many toys at once, like a one-man factory. He set out gears, frames and various metal shapes to form rows of boats, trains or dolls. But Peter was different. Peter was a clockwork doll. His body was formed with from hammered tin. His way no work is created from the goyers and clogs. Cogs of a discarded cuckoo cock. Strittle and made dolls that would wave, twist and bow, but Peter would could do all three and then some. Strittle spent months on a toy, bending pieces this way and that, often staying up late in the night, a frown over his tie scrip scrap of metal. Since Chiltel had no family of his own, he poured all his love in his lovely heart, possessed in a little doll. Finished at last, he sat the tiny man in a place of honour beside the crash register. Peter charmed all of the customers with his bright red cap and glowing coat. Whenever a child came into the shop, she still would return the tiny key. His back and Peter would go through a special routine. He'd move his hat, bow, and dance a jig. Fast at first and slower and slower as the clockwork ran down. 
Children clapped and squealed in delight, and parents would ask how much. She had always folded his arms, shook his head, and beamed until his round cheeks turned pink. Not for sale, you say. He's my special one. He had almost created Coretta, his clockwork woman, when he noticed a change of Peter. Sometimes he turned on the key, Peter's antics went on after clockwork wound down. Occasionally the toy would give an extra bow wave. When Stitcher was alone in the shop, working on Gretel's parts, he'd hear a tiny quiet creak. He'd look up to see Peter's tiny face turned towards him, his shiny painted eyes, ga- eyes gazing at him, an extra twinkle. Stitcher hadn't added it with a brush. Just in the setting of his workman goggles, the old man always checked the toy over to see if he overlooked a floor, causing these strange movements. A magic tickled in the back of his mind, reminding him of his presence. Did Gritter progress much faster than Peter? Being Strauss's second doll of the kind, by the time he put the finishing touches on her blue milkmaid dress and formed a blank flower by golden metal curls, Sissel could no longer deny the truth. A magical toy ship had settled into Peter's tin heart. Peter's tin heart. Sissel wasn't frightened when he clanked over to the ta- tabletop on him and made a bow as deep his cap almost brushed the wooden top surface. After all, the toy shop was a place of joy and happiness, and therefore could only create good magic. From then on, when Sister polished and painted and tweaked, he would hear little snaps and creaks, and look up to see Peter standing beside him, watching in apparent fascination. The cane of night, he placed a complete gritter beside Peter. Peter placed a hand on Gritter's tin soldier. Shoulder made a creaking sound. Cecil's eyes widened. Though quiet, the doll had clearly said hello. A shudder ran through Greta's tin form. A head turned. Hello, she creeped back. Peter took Greta's hand together. They bowed before Street Cecil. Father, they said in unison. Following days were filled with fun. When Cecil twinkled at his workbench, the little doll played hide and seek among the tools and parts calling to each other in tiny voices. A night they snuggled in the doll's bed while Stitzel read them bedtime stories. When the customers came into the shop, they would play dollies, as they call it, entertain the children with their funny routines. Pete parents begged Sixel for a price he would always refuse. How could he sell his children? One day a dark cloud settled over the town. The factory owner had cared so much for his workers died. A wealthy man from a land far away purchased a factory for the family of the deceased. Whispered stories began to drift through the street about injuries from faulty machinery. Wages began to spiral down, and those who complained were fired and set out on the street. Workers trudged by Churchill's toy shop, and weary feet with no extra coins in their pockets for such trivial things as toys. Children could press cold noises, noses to shop windows to gaze at the forbidden treasures. Only a few weeks after this turn of events, Churchill sat at his counter, sliding a few pennies he managed to collect in a tin box. Peter and Getter and stood before him, dancing their pretty jig. He forced himself to smile. What did they know of this cool world? The magic shop had weakened from the sadness, but the dolls remained happy and full of joy. Not long after, Schwitzel was forced to give up peaceful life. He sold his remaining toys for pennies. An old woman brought the shop to turn into a day-old bread store. With his money, Schwitzel knew he could survive for a short time. One of Schussel's good friends owned a theatre in the middle of the town. He offered Schussel a small loft above the of the help for building repairs. When the toy worker arrived, he unpacked his few possessions and packed them around, placed them around the tiny apartment. At last, he pulled out his greatest treasure, a cobble box containing two clockwork dolls and their beds. The toys stretched and looked around them in bewilderment. Father, where is this? Is the workshop? Where are the children? Peter asked. Trisha began to cry in great heaving sobs. The toys patted him and laid their cold tin heads against his tear-stained cheeks. Every day Trisha went to look for work. He was too old for factories to consider. And all the shop's owners would shake their heads in regret. Sometimes he sold small parcels of firewood he gathered from the woods near Bart Town. Martin, he brought... Peter and Greta out to the streets. They could attract a reasonable crowd and bring smiles the most dismal faces with antics. After dancing merry jigs or doing acrobatics, dolls attended to wind down with hat 
outstretched. Children pleaded for their parents. Some of the crowd always reduced the spare pennies to Switzel could, could wind them up again. When he walked home every day, Switzel struggled with guilt of bringing his children back to, to the gloomy department. But when he saw the pinched faces of any of her children, he could comfort himself and think at least my children would never go hungry. One gloomy day, he drained, drenched the dreary street, left a maze of puzzles in its wake. She still would almost chose to stay home, but his stomach rumbled and he was too wet to gather wood, dry enough to sell. So he picked up the cupboard bo- cover box and stepped down a narrow, dark staircase to the ground floor of the, of the ladder. Then any voices strained for the wells of the box, while the door was taut in excitement about children when they, they were seen that day. Cecil held the box close to his ear. I love you, Peter. I love you, Greta. Cecil has chuckled to himself. He never sees to fill him with wonder. The tiny people have come to into his life. Oh, they are dolls. What could they possibly understand about love? Found an oaring in a by a busy street. Set out for the day. Despite the mist, quite a few people scurried through the lanes. So the clockwork dolls who fawned for a larger crowd than ever. He emptied their tin caps into the a big one. And for long, it was jingling with coins. Happy events was erupted by children's cry. Run for your lives! A black carriage crashed through the crowd, drawn by four Emily steeds. A coachman had collected the bits of foam mixed with blood steamed from the cobalt mouths. They reared and plunged through the mud in a wild eyed frenzy. People screamed and scattered to scrunched dolls stood in the middle of the street where they had been kicked by frightened children's feet. She still pleaded from the side, Come to me, come, my children. But they could not hear for this madness. Hand in hand they ran, ran in the wrong direction. Under the wicked wheels of courage, the carriage cluttered away and the street cleared. No one saw old man Switzel when he bent to collect the broken parts of his dolls. He tried to home, clean the mud from the twisted pieces of tin as best as he could, placed them back into the cardboard box. He decided to bury them in the quiet place after raining stopped. The air in the room rested on his shoulders like a leaden swirl. Every spark of magic had been sucked away. Now I have lost everything, he wept. Next morning, Dawn poked a cold finger in the apartment's single small window. A scratching sound came from the box. Not a rat, he howled. This is uh, that's the absolute worst. Picked a box with intent to fling the filthy animal against the wall. A breezy bit of magic swirled past his face and flew open the top of the lid. Peter's shiny brown eyes stared up from the box. The old man stared in wonder at perfectly formed clockwork chilled with golden curls, Greta's dimpled cheeks and a jumper of green and blue. The child waved a tin hand 